Is it well with your soul? Amen. Amen. It is well with my soul. So today we're coming to the end of our journey through 1 John. We've been there for several weeks, probably quite a few months actually now. Um, we know that it was written by the Apostle John to counter false Gnostic um, teachings, um, which had been permeating in the church, unsettling and leading perhaps um, some from, I suppose, the assurance of the truth about who Jesus actually is. Um, you know, his fact about his life, that he came in the flesh, um, that he's fully divine, he's fully God, but he's also fully man. Um, and there were truths that uh, were leading people, I suppose, um, yeah, away and astray uh, from uh, the, the truth of the gospel, the simple truth of the gospel. Um, you know, Jesus is fully divine. He has to be fully divine to save us. He became fully man. He has to be fully man, fully human to save us. And uh, these people were teaching all sorts of things um, that uh, were leading um, people to, to doubt that and leading people astray and also causing um, people to live lives, I suppose, that were not pure lives before God. Um, they taught that you know, matter was evil, the spirit was good. Um, that was one of the things they taught. Um, and so if um, the spirit was good and matter was evil, then there's no way that God in Jesus could come in the flesh because God could not associate himself uh, with matter. Um, but because of that, then for ourselves, that uh, you know, one of the things they taught was that um, it didn't matter what you did in the body because the body didn't really matter. It was the spirit that was good. So that led to all sorts of awful, immoral behavior. Um, and so uh, this was a, a major heresy that was um, springing up um, in the, the early years of the church. And so John was led by the Lord, led by the Holy Spirit to, to write this uh, epistle um, to uh, counter that uh, and to give people um, the assurance. We're talking about assurance today. Assurance of what it is to know the gospel, to stand in the gospel of who Jesus is and who we are in Christ. We've learnt as we've journeyed through three things about God. Um, that God is life. He's the creator of physical life. He's eternal, but he's also the source of spiritual new life. We've also learned that God is light. He says God is light and there is no darkness in him. 1 John 1 verse 5 Light, truth, holy, sinless, perfect in every way. We've also learned that God is love. That's the third L. Um, you know, it says God is love. And he showed that love for us by sending the Lord Jesus Christ to die on the cross, to be that sacrifice, to bear my sin, to bear our sin for all who will believe and trust in him. Love is a doing word. It's not just simply a passive thing. It's a doing word. Because God loves us, Jesus came, Jesus went to the cross. Jesus left the glory of heaven and went to the cross. So that's three things we've learned about God. We've also learned three key truths about ourselves as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, or three key tests, things that should be evident in our lives if we are followers of Jesus. The first one is um, what we call the moral test. Um, it says uh, in 1 John 1, um, but if we walk in the light, in the truth as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. So Jesus is light. God is light. We are called to live in the light and believe that truth, um, that Jesus is the one where we find eternal life. He's fully God. Um, we also learnt uh, about a doctrinal test. Um, if we say we love Jesus, um, we need to keep his commandments. Uh, 1 John 1, uh, for a beg pardon, 1 John 2, verses 3 to, to 6. Uh, by this we know we have come to know him. If we keep his commandments... Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word in him, truly the love of God is perfected. So that's the, the doctrinal test. You know, if we say we're believers, we should follow. Uh, we should keep the commandments that God has given to us. And Andrew shared last week that, in a sense, that the test of our love, if we say we love the Lord, is our obedience to the Lord. The two are hand in hand. You can't separate them. It's like a hand in a glove. Love and obedience go together. But then there's also a social test. 1 John 2, verses 9 to 10. Uh, whoever says he is in the light but hates his brother is still in darkness. But whoever loves his brother abides in the light, and in him there is no cause for stumbling. And so if we say we love God, well, the evidence for that should be seen in the love we have for one another, for brothers and sisters. It says in 1 John 4, if we say we love God who we have not seen, how can we... Um, 
yeah, if, so we're very frank, turn that around. If we say we love our brothers who we have seen, how can we love God whom we have not seen? So there should be this evidence lived out in our lives that, you know, if we say we are Christians, then there should be love for God, but love for fellow believers and also for non believers. So we're coming to today, and um, there's so much that can be drawn out of this passage. We don't have time to really particularly unpack it. I want to look at it very simply. Um, we've learned three things about God, three key truths about ourselves as believers. But um, we're going to look at three certainties that the believer in Jesus can have absolute assurance about. They can know. Okay, we can know. Three things we can know about our lives as Christians. So I'm going to read from 1 John chapter 5, verses 13 through to 21. If you've got a Bible, um, please follow on. Uh, we're not able to get the words projected today. If you've got a Bible at home as well, please uh, open the book. Open, as we say, open the mouth of God, um, and we'll read together. I'm just going to pop my glasses when I've got to that time of life where I'm not sure whether I need them or I don't, but anyway, we'll see. Right. So this is what John was led to write. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. And this is the confidence that we have towards him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests that we have asked of him. If anyone sees his brother committing a sin not leading to death, he shall ask, and God will give him life to those who commit sins that do not lead to death. There is sin that leads to death. I do not say that one should pray for that. All wrongdoing is sin, but there is sin that does not lead to death. We know that everyone who has been born of God does not keep sinning, but he who was born of God protects him, and the evil one does not touch him. We know that we are from God, and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. And we know that the Son of God has come and given us understanding so that we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true, in his Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. May the Lord bless the reading of his word to us this morning. The passage we've just read, um, there are two different uh, words um, in the Greek used for no. The one that's used mainly uh, in the passage um, is, I'll try and pronounce this, um, Ido. Okay, and that's a perfect tense with a present meaning. So it's looking and supposing a sense of what we know because we've perceived it, we've seen it happening in the past. Since we then we have a knowledge of it, but that gives us a certainty now in the present. Okay, so because of past experience of what we've seen, what we've perceived, uh, we have knowledge of it, but we have certainty now um, here in the present. It can mean to know fully. Okay, so that's Ido. Um, the second word um, for know, which is only used once in this passage, uh, towards the end of it, is ginosko. Uh, and that, in a sense, means taking in knowledge, coming to recognize, coming to understand. We could perhaps term it as progression in knowledge. That's not just by simple intellectual ability. This is an ongoing work in the believer's life by the blessed Holy Spirit who indwells us and leads us into all truth. We just need to be willing, open our hearts to the Lord and by his Holy Spirit, and he will continue to lead us into all truth. What did Jesus say to the Holy Spirit? One of the works of the Holy Spirit is to lead into all truth. He said he will take to the disciples what I give him and he will tell it to you. So it's a supernatural work of God in the believer's life. We simply need to humbly yield and he will instruct us and enable us. And so the first assurance and certainty um, that we've read about in verse 13, and we touch upon it in verse 20, is this. We have assurance and certainty of eternal life. And it's the word in verse 13, um, that you may know, I do, that you might know fully, that you might have absolute confidence, absolute assurance in that if you put your faith and trust in Jesus, we have eternal life. For God so loved the world 
And he gave his only son that whoever believes in him will not perish, but would have everlasting, would have eternal life. Eternal life now and an eternity with God after this life. We're called, verse 13, uh, to believe, to cleave, to throw upon ourselves, upon the Lord Jesus Christ, upon the mercy of God, to believe what God has said about his son. It's a matter of faith and not feelings. If we let feelings dictate us, then we're up and down and all over the place. There's no stability. But our faith is not a matter of feelings. Our belief is a matter of faith, assurance, cast iron, certain in the word of God. It's a fact. Dave Phillips said a couple of weeks ago, Dodd says it, I believe it, and that settles it. Let's stick with that. And we can have that absolute cast iron assurance, blessed assurance. You know, in our hearts, the Holy Spirit gives us that assurance that we have eternal life. We know experientially. Yes, we know, we read in the word of God, we believe, we trust it. But then leads to that experience, that knowing that feelings do come, but feelings should not dictate our lives. So we need to believe. If we believe, then we receive. And we can know with cast assurance that we have eternal life. Then in verse 20, you know, we read that we know that the Son of God has come. Absolutely, it's there in the Word of God. Um, he's come the first time to deal with sin. He's coming a second time to reign. And we will all meet him one day, either as our saviour, if we put our faith and trust in him in this life. But if we reject Jesus, if we don't believe, if we, we don't turn to him, we will all meet him one day. And that second time he comes, it will not be to save, it will be to judge those who've chosen not to believe in him. Where do you stand here today? Have you trusted in Jesus? Do you know him now as your saviour? I urge you, as we often say, call upon the coming judge to be your present saviour. He's given us understanding through the word of God. The veil of unbelief that blinds us has been parted. In a sense, the light has come on in the heart and mind of the believer. The darkness that was there of sin has been dispelled. It's been dealt with by Jesus at the cross. And we've read also that our lives are in Christ, verse 20. We are in him, in his true in his son, Jesus Christ. We sang earlier on about our lives being hidden, didn't we, with Christ in God. For the believer, our lives are hidden with Christ in God. Secure for all eternity. We can have assurance, brothers and sisters, about these things. Jesus is the source, the sustainer of eternal life. We may know with certainty that we have eternal life. But then also in verse 20, this is the only time that the second Greek word, ginosko, is used. And it says, he has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true. And that word there, ginosko, is that we might come to know him more and more. We might grow in our knowledge. We don't know everything about God. We never will, even in eternity. But we're on this amazing journey that day by day we're going to come to know Jesus as we trust him more and more. We might know him more fully. We might see him more clearly. We might love him more dearly. We might follow him more nearly. That's God's heart for me. It's God's heart for you. He just invites us to come as believers and to follow him, to believe and to trust. Recognize that we're going to grow in Christ as he speaks and as he leads and as he teaches each one of us. So we have assurance. We can know with certainty fully know that we have eternal life. We put our faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. The word of God says it. But when we come to faith and we know it experientially, we know we have a living relationship. The Holy Spirit indwells us. We commune with God. I'm not sharing about communing around the table, but daily we commune with God as we spend time in his word. You know, he walks with me. He talks with me. A long life's narrow way. He lives. He lives. Salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives? He lives within my heart, core of my being. He lives in the core of the being of every believer here today. So, assurance, certainty of eternal life. The second thing we can have assurance and certainty about from this passage um, is that if we ask in accordance with his will, God will hear and answer our prayers. Verses 14 
and 15. It says, this is the confidence. That word confidence suggests the freedom that we have. And we can come boldly, it says in Hebrews, before the throne of grace. We can come with confidence. We can receive mercy and grace from the Lord. Why? Because we have a great high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ, who died and rose again, who is now seated at the Father's right hand, praying and interceding for us. The way is open for us to come and to bring our prayers to God. There's a distinction, though, in this. It says that the confidence we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Just want to think about that word, hears. Okay. Um, God hears all prayers uh, in one sense. But the sense that's here is not just simply hearing, okay, but it's the sense of listening and having regard to. So there's a difference. Listening and having regard to. You might hear a buzz of conversation around you in a room, okay, but it's only when you focus upon perhaps the one conversation that you're truly listening, okay? And so God hears and knows all things. Nothing escapes his attention. But when he hears the prayer of the believer, um, it's... He's taking note of that prayer. He has regard of that prayer. In the Greek, it's a word, akouo. I'll try and pronounce that. Um, his ear is attentive to the cries of his children, believers. As a loving father, absolutely. I mean, as a father, um, when your children come to you, um, perhaps particularly when they're little, your ears are attentive to their cries, aren't you? Um, you know how um, the baby cries in the sense as to whether you know, he or she wants food or wants changing, um, whether there's something else, perhaps there's pain. There's a difference in that cry. But uh, you know that cry um, as the father or indeed the mother of that child. But God knows our heart's cries, whether we can vocalize it or not. If it's coming from our hearts, that groan that happens sometimes you know, in certain circumstances, God hears. The Holy Spirit is praying within us. Um, you know, an intercessor within us as well as an intercessor at God's right hand. Uh, Jesus at the Father's right hand, the Holy Spirit within us. That's an amazing thing. Nothing escapes his attention. Okay. Um, but it's not just the cries of his children, believers, but it's also the earnest, heartfelt and sincere cry of the non-believer. Uh, for help, for salvation. God hears that. What does it say in Romans? Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Amen. We all, once apart from the Lord, all of us who are believers here have called upon the Lord, have placed our confidence, our trust, we've thrown ourselves uh, upon the mercy of God, upon the Lord Jesus, and he has rescued us. When I was lost, he came and rescued me. He reached down to the pit, the pit that I was in, that you were in, and lifted me. Oh, Lord, such love when I was as far from you as I can be. But there are certain conditions um, in this passage. We touch on them for God to hear in that sense, to listen, to indeed have regard of, and then to answer our prayers. Um, it says we can have this ido, this absolute complete confidence that God will if we meet the conditions. And prayer is a massive subject. We can't really in any way sort of more than dip our toes in the water of this today. Uh, books have been written about prayer, um, many, many books. I just want to draw out um, four things very, very briefly. Uh, and this, in verses 14 and 15, is a sense about prayers of petition, about bringing our requests to God. Um, earlier in 1 John, 1 John 3, uh, verses 22 and 23, um, he says, we have confidence before God and whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do what pleases him. Verse 23, and this is his commandment that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he has commanded us. So if we are to receive what we have asked, we need to be walking in the truth. We need to be keeping his commandments. We need to be doing what pleases him. We need to ask Ask and you will receive. Knock and the door will be open to you. Seek and you will find, Matthew 7, 7. We need to ask for God. Uh, we need to present those requests to God. It demonstrates faith in God when we do ask him things. Um, and God delights to hear our requests when they come in the right way to him. But we need to come with the right motives. James 4, verses 2 and 3. Um, James says, you do not have because you do not ask. 
When you ask, you ask for the wrong motives, and so you do not receive. So there has to be the right motive in our request. And that motive ultimately must be, is it for your glory, Lord? That's the underlining factor. Is it, Lord, for your glory? And obviously in accordance with his will, which we'll touch on in a minute. If God's going to hear, as it were, our request, um, our petition, uh, we need to get rid of any sin uh, in our lives. Unconfessed sin in the life of a believer is an obstacle to God hearing in the sense of listening um, and having regard to our prayer if we're asking him for something. We need to confess that sin. Who can ascend the hill of the Lord, Psalm 24? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. All of us can come before the Lord. When we confess our sin, God is faithful and just to forgive and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But until we get rid of that sin and it comes out by the mouth, by confession, the only prayer that God will akuo, will listen and take note of, is that prayer of repentance. So we need to come, we need to, to deal with any sin uh, before we can present our requests to God. David said in Psalm 139, Search me, Lord, and know my heart. Try me. Find out if there's any sinful, any wicked way in me. Mark's touched on this already in communion. Yeah, we need to forgive others if God's going to forgive us. We also need to pray in accordance with his will, uh, 5.14. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And his will, his general will, revealed in the scriptures... God reveals his will um, in the scriptures. We don't know his hidden will. Um, he's chosen not to reveal that to us, but his revealed will in the scriptures, his promises to believers, his assurance of eternal life for those who will believe and trust in him. A quote from a theologian, Adam Clark says this, prayer is the language of the children of God. Who is he who is begotten, so born again as a believer of God, speaks this language. He calls God Abba, Father, in the true spirit of supplication. Prayer is the language of dependence on God. Where the soul is dumb, there is neither life, love, nor faith. Faith and prayer are not boldly to advance claims upon God. We must take heed that what we ask and believe for is agreeable to the revealed will of God. What we find promised by God, that way may bring to him, that we may plead before him. So prayer is not a matter of my seeking to bend God to my will, but of my yielding to him and my bending my will to, to his will. Watchman Nee said this, prayer according to the will of God is only possible when we ourselves are in harmony with his will. Harmony, that suggests an intimacy, doesn't he? Uh, it, I beg your pardon. Harmony with his will. And David in Psalm 37, 4 said this, Delight yourselves in the Lord and he will grant you, think about petitions, the desires of your heart. As we come and grow and yield and abide in Jesus. So the Holy Spirit will move our hearts more to the things of God, the will of God. His desires become our desires. And that's why David could say he will grant you the desires of your heart. When his desires are our desires, then we know we're praying in accordance with the will of God because that's what God has purposed. We can willingly say, not my will be done, but thy will be done. And the last thing we need is faith. We need to believe that God will grant our requests in accordance with those conditions. Jesus said in Matthew eleven twenty four, whatever you ask in prayer, believe you have received it and it will be yours. Another theologian said this, our petitions are granted at once when we prayed, if we prayed in accordance with the will of God, so the Holy Spirit has led us to pray, but the results of the granting are received in the future. You might not always get that answer now. It might be wait. I have a time for that. And there's perhaps many people here who have been praying for the salvation of loved ones for many, 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 many years. But we know that's God's heart, that all will be saved. We believe that that is a prayer that God will answer. Keep on praying for them. 
for family members who perhaps strayed, keep on praying for them. I know when I strayed for many, many years, people were praying for me. And by God's grace, he drew me back into that close walk with him. So we need to be persistent sometimes also. Think about the widow and the judge. We need to be persistent at times in our prayers. And believe that God will answer. Does God save everyone who we pray for? No, is the answer to that. I can't give you that categoric assurance. But in his revealed will, he calls us to pray. We have to leave that then with, with him. So those are thinking about prayers of petition. But now we move on to this quite difficult in a sense, a couple of verses about uh, John's prayers regarding prayers of intercession in verses 16 and 17. It says, If everyone sees his brother committing a sin not leading to death, he shall ask, and God will give him life. In a sense, this is the application, isn't it, of the, the third test. If we say we have love for God, we need to love one another. Earlier in 1 John, again, 1 John 3, um, it talks about... Um, you know, if we see a brother or a sister in need and close our hearts against them, how does God a love abide in that person? Let us, little children, not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. So that's a material need. But surely it's an even greater thing if we see a brother or sister in spiritual need, perhaps struggling with a particular sin, maybe they're backsliding, to, to act, to, to pray for them. We're instructed here to do so. We all have a pastoral responsibility towards one another. We are, in a very real sense, our brother and sister's keepers. We're called to care for the souls of each other. It's not just the, the elders, the deacons, the pastoral team. It's one another. You know, perhaps if we see a brother or sister struggling in sin in some way, we need to be there alongside to, to pray with them, absolutely. But then perhaps to speak to them as well as the Lord leads, to come alongside, to listen, to, to try and, um, as the Lord leads us, um, help them to, to overcome um, by his power, through the Holy Spirit, through the truth of God's word. It says that God will grant life. I think life in the sense of he will sustain, perhaps restore, uh, will be there for them quote from David Guzak um, about this verse, God promises to bless the prayer made on request or behalf of a brother or sister in sin. Perhaps such prayers have special power before God because they are prayers in fulfillment of the command to love the brethren. Surely we love each other best when we pray for each other. I think that's very, very true. Um, if we truly say we love someone, then we will pray for them, as well as act, if it's a physical thing, to support and help them. But there's an exception, isn't there? And this is this sort of bit that uh, needs a little bit of unpacking. We haven't got much time, but I will do what I can. I can't look at it in detail. I would encourage you to read commentaries. There are different thoughts around this. The exception is this. Uh, we're advised not to pray um, for the person who's committing sin that leads to death. And so the question arises, what then is this sin that leads to death? And does it refer to spiritual death, or does it refer to, to physical death? So these are some thoughts. Okay, if you're thinking it's uh, spiritual death, we know that before we came to Christ, we were all spiritually dead in our trespasses and sins. But when we put our faith and trust in Jesus, we've been born again of the Holy Spirit, we received eternal life. Every believer knows that. We have absolute assurance and certainty of it, as we said earlier on. But for those who persist in unbelief and never turn to Christ, the Bible teaches that there is a second death after this life. We will all die physically because of the fall, but the non-believer who never turns to Christ will experience eternal separations from God in what is described as the lake of fire and sulfur in Revelation 20. It's described as the second death. Those who've been born twice, so physically, and then new birth, spiritually, by the Holy Spirit, die once. Physical death, we go to be with the Lord. But those who have only been born once, physically, and have never come to faith and trust in Jesus, who have never been born again, will die twice. There is a physical death, and then there is an eternal death. Have you been born again? That's the 
question here for each and every person and listening at home. Do you know you've been born again? Only those who've been born again will have eternity with God. So John is writing, as we know, to counter these false Gnostic teachings uh, and the teachers. And they've been in the fellowship, but we read in 1 John 2 that they've left the fellowship because they were never truly born again. They were never believers, even though they masqueraded as believers. They left that church fellowship. And if they continued in that unbelief and that falsehood, they would ultimately be committing the sin that would lead to the second death, spiritual death. However, when we read this passage, John starts it with this. If anyone sees his brother, so he's talking about a brother or sister, we know that that is a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. And therefore, this can't refer to spiritual death, that second death of eternal separation from God, because believers do not lose their salvation. And so the thing we're left with, and this is the way I read this, and you might see it differently, read around it as I said, but the death here it's referring to is physical death. And what he's talking about here is a very highly abnormal situation where because a Christian persists in committing sin, or because of the seriousness of the sin that has been committed, it causes God to act and literally take that believer home to glory because their testimony has become so compromised. John MacArthur says this about this possible Meaning, such a sin could be any premeditated and unconfessed sin where failure to repent and forsake it may eventually lead to physical death as the judgment of God as he seeks to preserve the purity of his church. So God will act at times to preserve the purity of his church where a believer's testimony is so compromised and take that person literally out, take them home. Two instances in scripture, time is ticking away. Think about Ananias and Sapphira, early part of the church life. They lied against the Holy Spirit. They died. God brought judgment upon them. I believe they were believers, but because God wanted to maintain the purity of the church, he took them, literally took them out and took them to himself. And then the other one in scripture, Joel touched on this last week, is in our taking of communion in an unworthy manner. That means indifferently, unrepentantly, withholding forgiveness. We've touched on this through Mark. Keeping bitterness in our hearts. It says that some have fallen asleep, some have died. They've been taken by God because of that withholding forgiveness, taking communion in that unrighteous manner over a period, I would believe, of time. As believers, we don't know God's hidden will in such matters. And so... John doesn't categorically say, do not pray for the believer in sin. But what I would say is this. When we're praying for a brother and sister, we see who is committing sin. It's only when the Holy Spirit puts a burden on our hearts to pray for that person that we can truly and effectively pray and we'll keep praying for that person. If there's no unction from the Holy Spirit, then we, we very quickly lose as it were, momentum. So no unction to pray, we can't pray effectively. No desire from the Lord to do so. So yes, God can take people, as it were, out and take them home because of a compromised testimony or because of persistent sin. Moving on to our last point that we can have assurance and certainty of. As born again, God's born again children, that we're protected by the Lord Jesus Christ, verses 18 and verses 19. You know that everyone who has been born of God does not keep sinning. That's the normal situation for a Christian. What I described a minute ago is abnormal. But he who was born of God protects him. The evil one does not touch him. He who was born of God, it's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. God the Son who came in the flesh. He is the one who protects the believer from the devil. And we can know it with absolute certainty. What does the song say? Through many dangers, toils and snares, I have already come. Was grace that brought me safe thus far and grace will lead me home. You know, in the Old Testament, uh, you know, God is there described as a shield, a refuge, a rock, a deliverer. It says the evil one does not touch him. 
God allows the enemy to, to test us at times. But the word here in the Greek is not talking about a superficial touch or a glance. But it signifies being attached to, being laid hold of, being grasped firmly. So Satan cannot attach himself to, cannot lay hold of, cannot grasp the believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. Because Jesus protects us. We also read that obedient believers do not continue to sin. The child of God may sin, but his or her normal condition is resistance to evil, someone has said. We're not sinless, but as we grow with Christ, we sin less. Talking about, just briefly, the, the devil being able to take, a, as it were, I suppose, a foothold in our lives. Yes, he can't attach himself to us as he can, and... Uh, take over us as he can a non-believer, but if we have unconfessed sin in our lives, it does allow him a foothold. We'll experience guilt and condemnation. It will damage our witness. We'll become ineffective as Christians. The remedy, confess it to God. Ask for forgiveness. Ask a brother or sister to come alongside and to pray and to help and support you if you're feeling under uh, that particular sort of, I suppose, yeah, assault from the enemy. But he can never overtake us because Jesus is the one who protects us. So, our time has gone. We've really skimmed through this. There's so much more that could have been said. But we have assurance, absolute certainty of eternal life. We have assurance and absolute certainty that we ask in accordance with his will, God will hear and answer our prayers. We have assurance and certainty that as God's born-again children, we are protected by the Lord Jesus Christ. So let us be encouraged today in our walk with Jesus. Joel's already mentioned uh, this passage of Scripture, but it's here as well. 2 Timothy 1.12. May we be able to say in the words of the chorus, I know whom I believeth, and I am certainly is able to keep, that is to guard that which I have committed, that's my life in eternity, unto him against that day when we stand before Jesus. But the last verse, we've always got to be on guard and alert to anything in our lives that would seek to take the rightful place of the Lord Jesus Christ. Anything that becomes perhaps an idol, and that could be many different things, but anything that encroaches on that place Jesus should have, that's an idol. There's another hymn which I'm just going to finish with now. Ask God to search our hearts and show us if there are those things in our lives that are encroaching. The hymn by William Cowper says this. I make this our prayer um, as we finish. The dearest idol I have known, whatever that idol be, help me to tear it from my throne and worship only thee. So shall my walk be close with God, calm and serene my frame, so pure a light shall mark the road that leads me to the Lamb. God bless you. Amen.